Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Bible study of St. James Presbyterian Church, where we are going to be studying the common lectionary readings for this Sunday, June 30th, 2024, the 13th Sunday in ordinary time for our worship here on the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in the city of New York, but in the village of Harlem. We're going to start with our wonderful Song of Ascent, Psalm 130. Psalm, 100 and, Psalm 120, I believe, through 134, a collection of Ascent Psalms. And they, the superscription refers um, to sort of two things, most likely. Um, the songs used by pilgrims as they are ascending or going up to Jerusalem that they would sing or that they would chant as they were going all the way up there. Um, if you remember in some of the pictures of, of Israel, you see that there's a Mount of Olives. Um, there's the Garden of the Olives where there is, and then there's like this incline that goes up to the city way uphill. So that as you're going up to it and you're looking at the city, you would be saying these particular Psalms. And it's also known for its literary step-like parallelism, which I've noted um, by some of these asterisks in here um, that sort of explain why these particular psalms are lumped together. In this particular psalm, we're waiting, they're waiting for the Lord's redemption. And this is an individual petition for seeking um, rescue, but seeming even more intent on simply just being heard by God. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. And I just realized that that verse 8, it is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities, that in many times when people are ascending to go to the temple in Jerusalem, they're going to bring their sins for, um, for Yom Kippur and, and uh, the Day of Atonement so that they are taking all of their sins so that they will be redeemed by the priest who will go into the Holy of Holies and take them to the Lord and come out with God's blessing. So this is truly mm -hmm. a moment that really speaks to these holy holidays in the, in the calendar here. Uh, the usual statement of trust takes the forms of a resolution to wait for the Lord. So even though this, um, we're waiting for the Lord to hear our voice, um, we, we resolve to wait. I will wait um, in those verses five through six. And the other common feature of petitions is teaching to revere the Lord that appears in verse seven and eight. Um, and verses 1 through 6, the psalmist desired to be heard, as we saw. And verse 7 to 8, the psalmist in Israel is waiting for the redemption, for the redeeming of the Lord God's self. Out of the depths I cry gives you the, inc in the inclination that God is too distant to hear the psalmist's voice. I never sort of put that with that together before that God being too distant to hear the psalmist's voice and so he cries out please please hear me um, at the middle of the psalm the psalmist reminds God of God's own forgiving nature there's this way of complimenting God to remind that sort of helps God to say well, yes, I am that kind of a forgiving God, so maybe I should listen to you and I won't mark your iniquities and I'll just forgive them. I won't take hold of them. But this notion of praising God and complimenting God and reminding God of God's favor is a powerful, a wonderful way of um, understanding how this, this psalm sort of speaks and how this prayer goes forward to God. Wait. 
weight is repeated three times, and that's an example, the primary example of this step parallelism. Waiting is waiting expectantly, which I love, is a form of prayer. It mm. fits in with some of the thoughts that we've had over the past year about waiting expectantly um, with the faith that it will be. But, but that form of prayer of waiting expectantly, I know what the Lord is going to do. And the psalmist is either in this particular case waiting for an oracle or some other divine intervention. My soul waits, my soul waits. And that actually is our song for our hearing mm -hmm. today. Do you have any thoughts or ideas around this psalm or anything that spoke to you um, specifically to your heart or spirit? I heard somebody say, hmm. So waits. So then we will move on after our prayer of thanksgiving for that to our first reading in Second Samuel, the first chapter, um, chap verse one, and then verses seventeen through twenty-seven. I'm going to say that there is much context that surrounds this in verses 2 through 16, but that's not really in our pericope today. David, um, there's a controversy about David in the book of Samuel, the, book, the books of Samuel that, um, that say that the writer of Samuel is really just trying to make David out to be like a really good king no matter what, and shows that God's favors with him no matter what. Even when he has Bathsheba's husband killed, um, he's lifted up as his, as his I'm sorry to God of being a model way of coming to God and asking for God's mercy. Um, and so this is sort of another element of this that we're going to be speaking to today. Verses 1 through 16 is where David learns of the death of Saul and Jonathan. Um, and verses 17 through 27 is David's elegy over Saul and jo Jonathan. In this case, the definition for elegy would be a song or a poem expressing sorrow and lamentation, especially for one who is dead. Some scholars actually think that this whole understanding, this whole account of um, in First Samuel, um, think that this is a separate tradition of the same account in First Samuel 31, with which it disagrees. Um, and ultimately it brings the man who brings the news of, of the death um, of Saul and, and, um, and Jonathan. Um, it changes it for he changes the words for it for his own benefit. So, but we'll go ahead and read these verses and talk a little bit more about it. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation, this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, your glory, O Israel, lie slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of Philistines of the Philistines will rejoice the daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil no more. The blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. 
They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Mm. This beautiful, beautiful lamentation. Some scholars think it is plausible that the text is an at, that the text attribution of authorship to David himself. Um, that it is plausible that these are the words of David as written. This song of the bow in Hebrew simply says, um, he ordered that the bow be taught to the people of Judah, to, to Judah, um, is written in the book of Jashar. Jashar is a collection of poems that no longer exists. We don't have a copy of that, but it's also listed in um, Joshua 10:13. Your glory, in this, your glory is not an allusion to God. It's an allusion to the glory of Israel, which is Saul and Jonathan. Tell it not to Gath, Ashkelon, or, um, because those are the Philistine cities. The, the enemies would indeed exult um, in the uncircumcised, that, that, that wonderful little insult, that disparaging term for the Philistines, the uncircumcised will, un, will exult. Uh, Lisa brought that up last week and she came right in on the very moment we were talking about that again. Um, but that they will praise and that they will be gloating over this. And the mountains, the mountains upon which Jonathan and Saul were slain, the site of the battle where they were killed, the mountains of Goboa, of Go Goboa. David claims he, he curses it and says, let there be no rain upon you or bounteous fields because it is the place where Saul and um, Jonathan were killed, yes, and his shield, these shields were made with leather and anointed with oil to keep them battle ready. This is much different than the shields we talked about last week, the one that was carried around by, by the armor bearer of, of Goliath. Um, now you see the difference in their, in their, out, their war outfits. Um, is that Goliath's was made of some sort of a, a metal and theirs are made of steel, are made of um, leather that they oil to keep battle ready and supple. When he says, O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you with crimson and luxury. It really connotes that Saul's reign, as much as he was rejected by God, did bring pos prosperity to Israel. Um, and how the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. One thing that I didn't highlight because they didn't, they didn't put in here in the comments is that Saul in verse 23, I'm at verse 23 here. Saul and Jonathan beloved and lovely in life and in death they were not divided. If you remember in the story of David and, and, and Saul and Saul's anger mm -hmm. towards David and, and Jonathan's even hiding of David from Saul, um, that Jonathan never left his father's side, even though he wanted to be with David, he protected David by staying by his father's side. He made sure that he stayed there. And so David is honoring that here, even in this particular, um, that particular verse. This verse 26b, greatly beloved were you to me, your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women, expresses the closeness of David's relationship to Jonathan. And some scholars say, but does not necessarily imply a sexual relationship. Other scholars differ in this opinion, but if nothing else, it praises the intimacy of this male bond between Jonathan and, and David. And that's really the purpose of this is to show the, the, the intimacy of this love between the two um, who David now takes over as pure king. The, the kingship that Jonathan gave him in our reading 
last week as well. And of course, this they mentioned the, the sexuality in this because, as I mentioned before, this relationship is often lifted up, especially the fact that this is the scripture for Pride Sunday in New York City. The last time I preached this on Pride Sunday, it was several years ago at the First Presbyterian Church in Brooklyn. Um, so it hasn't been around, and that was like 10 years ago. And I haven't preached this particular text on that Sunday. It hasn't fallen like that. The parade and stuff hasn't fallen on the same day in 10 years. But here we have this, the death of Saul. Um, the Amalekites are, are um, thought to be scavengers. That's one of the things I read in between the verses 2 through 16. So that they're, the things that they, the way that Saul's body is sort of laid out and, and how they are, um, how they are disrespected in death. Um, David really made sure that the Amalekites got, got it coming to them, had what was coming to them um, for how they treated these two. So your thoughts around this, some of this beautiful lamentation of David for Saul and Jonathan. I, well, I noticed that there's a lot of mention of women and daughters and the, the women are going to... Um, be upset and so forth but there's several mentions of women um which just seemed i don't know unusual i just wondered if you knew of any particular meaning around that um, well if you remember and if you remember a couple of weeks ago when when we are talking when when samuel when the people of israel told samuel that they wanted a king mm -hmm. god said that your king is going to take your daughters Mm. So, and they're going to, he's going to make them your courtiers. He's going to make them weave. He's going to make them, you know, do the jewelry and all this other stuff. And David twists that into this, into this praise. Mm. So, the, for, so what we understand as God saying to, um, saying to Samuel, don't worry about it. They're not the king that they think that they're going to get is not the king that they're going to get it's going to be completely different and they get saul and this is what saul has done and god said that saul would do this that saul would take your daughters and and bring them in and all this stuff but david turns it into a praise mm -hmm. which shows you the duality of how the texts are understood especially between first and second samuel how how something that was meant for naught in first samuel um, that whenever it's attributed, anything is sort of attributed to David, it's brought out into a positive light, <laughs> which is what I was mentioning earlier. And that's yet another instance of that. So thank you for bringing that out. Any other thoughts on this particular thing? Yeah, I was thinking about the relationship between Jonathan and David. And I was thinking about my dad and my godfather. Mm. They became friends when they were little tiny boys living in Harlem. And they just remained fast friends for the rest of their lives, you know? Yeah. And I've never seen a friendship like that, you know? It's like my... Um, Godfather was my father's best man at his wedding. You know, they, uh, at one point in time, they had a mustache growing contest going on, you know. <laughs> they started wearing bow ties at the same time, you know. They were really, mm -hmm. like, in tune with one another, you know. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not sh so sure that David is actually saying that you know, like he's not attracted to women or anything, but he's saying that the, this is a relationship that women can't touch, you know? And there's, there's like I mentioned before, in, in 1500, there's a Midrash commentary from Jewish scholars um, or priests who said, Jewish rabbis who wrote um, about three great loves in the Bible, and out of all of them, I can't remember that it specifically, but out of all of them, that the love of David and Jonathan was the purest and most ideal because they did not expect anything from one another. 
Mm -hmm. and that kind of a relationship and that kind of a love um, is to be idealized. Um, and that that's, that was a beautiful way of looking at that. And I think how I, my sermon's on my website, I think, but how I turned it out in the sermon, I said, well, wouldn't that be interesting if we really had the love of David and Jonathan for people who walked through the doors of our churches, <laughs> not expecting anything of them other than to worship and be with us and to share the love. <laughs> So there's much to think about. And I also love the way that um, whenever you have any kind of an intimate relationship between men in the Bible, it's either sexualized or defended for not being sexualized. <laughs> but it's like met, there can be intimacy, as you were mentioning, intimacy and closeness in male relationships. And when you hold that kind of tightness together, you actually help build up male strength and male relationships and community, and you help build up family and so on and so forth. So I think this is one of those hidden gems in the Bible that is not lifted up enough about the power of when, when, when male, we have Ruth and Naomi, right? But the power of male intimacy here in just this notion, um, David is a very intimate an emotional man. He has the most beautiful even lament for his son Absalom when Absalom is killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is one of the most heartbreaking renderings of a father whose son, whose estranged son is killed um, and how he loves him and laments and moans for him. David is very a very good example of, of how, it, how you are a strong man and an intimately emotional man as well. <laughs> and it also causes him to act foolishly <laughs> killing people indiscriminately you know <laughs> I think the person who comes to tell him that Saul has been killed or something like that he's like come tell me tell me what happened tell me what happened and David like angrily has him killed and it's like wow he <laughs> did what you asked him to do <laughs> but it's that emotion and that power and his emotion there And it allows us to to see that kind of a love in a, in a in a beautiful way. So this is our tell it not in gas. But you know, Andrea, the the daughters of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, there is a when you think about that phrase or phrases like that in the text, it is a it is often used and often often written in situations of extreme um, causation for the for the to, to extreme ways of explaining the depth of the pain and lament of Israel itself. Hmm. Calling on the daughters of Israel to weep. The the daughters of Israel wept when the Egyptian the Egyptian boys were killed. The daughters of Israel wept when Jesus escaped to Egypt and those boys were killed. Hmm. Jesus says, Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. Hmm. So there is this power in the and the emotive um, understanding that this that only women can can speak to the pain and the power of loss so desperately. Yeah, that's that's just what I was thinking. It's um, women have a specific. Uh, it's not purpose, but it's a it's a a calling in a way. Um, but both in weeping, but in so many other places in the Bible where, you know, you don't hear about these deep relationships necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but you hear about their, their, their caring for and, and attending to other people, particularly well, men. Well, you know, it was also women who, who traditionally dressed the dead. 
Yeah. You know, carried the ointment and and anointed the body of the dead. So there's that. There's that. Well, the way I like to think of it, um, and I explained this when I was talking about quilting in West Virginia, is that there is a community that gets built and your stories get told and your relationships get built around that caring. Right. You know, people in and people making quilts and quilting bees and so on and so forth for communities, you know, they're doing it because they're caring for a family. They're caring for someone who needs it. We do it and we have it in different understanding, but people were cold and they needed quilts. People, you know, were poor and they needed quilts and they would talk about what was going on in the community. They would talk about what the needs were in the community. And there's this and I and I like to posit that with the women. Um, all of the women in the book of Ruth, you know, they looked after Ruth and Naomi saying, come to the fields and glean, come, we, we will protect you in here and this and that. And they all come in glory in the birth of the child. There is this undergirding um, power filled relationship of the community of women in Israel that gets lifted up every now and then, but never gets spotlighted. So that's why I try and spotlight it all the time. Right. Exactly right. It's also because that's what I grew up with. So <laughs> in my family. So. Yeah. So that's some deep stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. grateful to you for that. And we're going to get to some women in just a little bit, but we're going to move to Paul right now. Paul is uh, talking to these Corinthians again. Um, he's talking about all of their gifts. Paul often mentions the, the Corinthian spiritual gifts of faith, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, 13, um, 2, 8, 2 and 8, um, on their gifts of speech in 1 Corinthians 1, 5, 14, 9, and their gifts of knowledge in 1 Corinthians 1, 5, 12, 8, 13, 2, 8, 2 and 8, and 14, 6. However, these mentioning of the gifts in the that are listed here in 1 Corinthians. Um, he mentions them. I'm not saying that he lifts them up. He mentions them, but they're also mentioned as a criticism that they excel in all of this, but they get too hung up on being the people that excel in all of this. So now at the end of this particular letter, what he's doing is he's entreating them to move just past all of those other gifts that they have and say, you know, there are other things that you're good at that I need you for. This is his fundraising letter for Jerusalem. This is his fundraising portion. Andrea, this is a wonderful thing to study for fundraising. <laughs> uh, you take people's um, uh, attributes that that may hold them from giving and may hold them from being, you know, what you ideally want as a community. And he turns it around and makes it a, a plea to them and entreaty to them to give. So here, Second Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the eagerness, against the earnestness of others. For you know how generous, how, how the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich, and in this matter, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, 
the one who did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little the one who had didn't the one who had much did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little yeah paul go ahead ask for money <laughs> ask for money for these people um by buttering them up with their gifts and and our love for you the agape love of caring for one another the way that is holy and god does for us and other ancient authorities says um and in your love for us in your eagerness and in your love for us we want you to excel in this generous undertaking and you can of course know more on the superiority of love um over every other spiritual gift in which book in which chapter and verse first corinthians 13 13 if i have not love verses 10 through 14 paul says giving my advice which he also does in first corinthians 7 25 paul encourages follow through on their promise of a gift on their pledge of a gift to make a fair balance their abundance matching the need of the poor in Jerusalem. When Paul starts churches, especially in Asia Minor, one of the things that he's also doing as he goes back to visit places and writes letters to places is to do fundraising for new church communities and fundraising for, for people who are poor in other Christ following communities. In the Church of Corinth, um, in our language, we would say that he has paired them as sister churches and he's asking for the sister church to follow through on their pledge to help their poorer people. And that's where, where we are with this particular thing. This scripture that is quoted here, the one who had much did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little, comes from, Exod comes from Exodus 16, 18. And in our New Revised Standard Version, it's translated as, but when they measured it by the omer, anyone who had gathered much had no excess, and anyone who had gathered little had no deficiency. Each household had gathered as much as it needed to eat. And the quotation, of course, is, the, um, is when manna fell and people actually gathered up the manna. But the quotation that we see here, the reason why I'm pointing this out, is to remember that Usually when Saul, when Paul or someone in the, in the, in the epistles are quoting the New Testament uh, or quoting the Old Testament or, or quoting the Torah, they're most likely quoting the Greek version of the Torah that was in the document called the Septuagint, which I've explained before was um, the, the, the Roman governor, the Roman government said, we know that you're going to keep reading this law, this ancient text, and we respect it, but you're not going to do it in Hebrew because you're going to speak Greek, so we're going to translate it in Greek. So they got 70 scholars to get together and translated the Torah and the, the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And that's very often the Greek that we read um, when we are hearing these um, quotations from Paul and others who write these letters. Now, I did have a, I do have a, particular Hebrew version that I want to read to you that it says, but when they measured it by the Omer, anyone who had gathered much had no excess and anyone who gathered little had no deficiency. Each household had gathered as much as it needed to eat. Now that I gave to you specifically because um, I wanted you to get the notion of this quote is is not just about um too much and too little but it's about everyone really having enough and making it paramount <laughs> to the fact that people were that each household had enough to eat when cared for by by god's grace and he's entreating them to do the same are you all still looking at this particular scripture for lectionary on my screen yes Okay, just wanted to make sure. Sometimes when I go between tabs, it doesn't go back. Mm. So here, what do you think of Paul's fundraising letter? Here's our, here's our, um, here's our fundraising campaign. <laughs> well, I've certainly written it down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it used for uh, for for religious folks and religious organizations, but it, it's just interesting that what you just read was about having enough to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not enough for a house, not enough to take care of your children, uh, you know, send them to school. It was about eating and that 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 seems from that passage that that was the most important, um, that if you are nourished, that you, the, the rest kind of comes behind that. Um, You'll see a little bit of that in our gospel text. That's a great, I'm glad you noticed that. Mm. And also remember that Paul is at, around at the time, his writings are closest to the time of Jesus' actual ministry. So the temple has not been destroyed yet. And when Jesus' prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread, remember Caesar had promised, you know, I'm going to be your, I'm going to be your, your pater. I'm going to be your father. I'm going to be your the one that will be your God, and I will always give you enough to eat. You will always, all of your needs will be supplied. And he hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. He didn't really care about them to do that. And so the people in Jerusalem and the poorer people in these communities who are not Roman citizens, who are not merchants, they aren't eating. They don't have, have enough to eat. So this is, and if you remember in the, in the book of Acts, when the early Christian communities that we read about um, about a month ago, when they came together, they came together and pooled all of their resources so that everyone would have enough. And that's what this whole thing is about, this community of giving to one another. Paul just made it about, um, let's give to other communities and other churches and your offerings will go to them because you are now the Gentiles who are the Gentiles who are actually in commerce with the Romans, um, you're going to be helping these other communities that need it as well. Any other thoughts on this particular scripture of Paul's? I like this. He's a sweet talker, isn't he? Especially after the second book of Corinthians where he tells them off so much. <laughs> now we get to one of the more infamous pericopes in Mark. Mark 5, chapter 21 through 43. Mark chapter 5, of course, always, we remember it starts with the demoniac and the release of all those demons and into the pigs. And now we're at a point where we have these two related healing stories. Um, what is it? And then the, the, I learned a new word today. This is another Markin intercalation <laughs> to insert or position something between or among existing elements or layer. It's an intercalation of two stories that share several features. This is the story of the woman um, with the issue of blood and the young girl um, who everyone sees as dead. There is the, it is attention to female suffering the number 12, restored physical and social well-being through contact, and I added through forbidden contact, touching of someone who's with blood and touching of the dead. So let's just hear this. Jesus has calmed the seas and gotten to the other side, and as they're going by through water the crowd is running around to the other side and when jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea then one of the leaders of the synagogue named jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly my little daughter is at the point of death Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. She was no better but rather grew worse. 
she had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately the hemorrhage stopped. She felt it in her body that she was healed of the disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the truth. He told her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he had said, when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know of this and told them to give her, give her something to eat. Let's talk about this intercalation. It's coming from the western side of the sea, presumably over to the eastern side. One of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus is a prominent religious figure who seeks Jesus' curative powers. And I just noticed that when we get into the house and they say to him, when they, they come and find Jesus, they say, well, why are you bothering the teacher? It must mean that there are people that have been following Jesus that have said, I know a man. <laughs> and that one of the leaders of the synagogue to come to Jesus and fall before his feet that's a phrase that is listed in here twice, to fall at the feet of Jesus. It is a, a phrase meaning honor, adoration, um, and recognition of his power and authority. Come and lay your hands on her. Oh, wait, in 23, I'm sorry. Uh, details of this story in verse 23 echoes biblical stories that credit Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24, and Elisha in 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, 18 through 37, with healing power. I put that one in, in particular because if you remember, we're trying to figure out who is this man? Is he Elijah come back? Is he the Messiah? Who is this man? Mark keeps us in the dark about that but he gives us these things that the people would have said, this is like Elijah and Elisha. The story that we're about to hear, could it be that this is Elijah come back as we have been waiting for him to come for so long? Come and lay your hands on her. 
this phrase, lay your hands on her, is also in Mark 131, when Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law and she gets up and serves. Lay your hands on her. You've done it before. Come and lay your hands on her, Jesus. As he's going, of course, so many other people, wherever he goes, are coming in on her and coming in on Jesus. And people are asking, in Jesus Christ, um, superstar, it's like this, I, I played that, that character, and it's, and it's very amazing to sing this song when you're going through this and you're feeling all of these people pulling on you and grabbing on you, saying, heal me, touch me, touch me, heal me, do something for me, Jesus. It's a really powerful thing to imagine being crowded, having people crowd in on you to be asking to be helped. She suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years. The purity laws in Leviticus 12, 1 through 8, and Leviticus 14, 25 through 30, they designate bleeding women as unclean. Bleeding women as unclean. So this means that when we think back to Bathsheba, when a woman goes through her menstrual cycle and she finishes, she must bathe in the mikvah and she must be declared clean by the holy person in the community to be able to be back in community. This happens with those who have leprosy, those who have sinned egregiously. This is sort of the Levitical law is that you must come to the priests. Not just, it's not the healing as it is the, the, the spiritual and social clearance to go back out into community and be among people again. And that's where we find out that Jesus gets mad at the temple because people are, they can't afford the sacrifices that they need for the, to take to the, to the priest so that the priest can let them go back into their community and the priest can say that you are healed or that God has forgiven you, you've given this sacrifice. They can't afford to do what they're supposed to do from the book of Leviticus. And that's another reason why Jesus gets really upset about that. So here's this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. This number 12 is a very important number. It's not just the, the age in which young men become young men, but it's also the age in which children who do not really in Greek have a gender and don't matter because you don't know if they're going to die or what's going to happen with them and they're not really prosperous or profitable until about 12 years old when you can get your young man to work and when you can marry off a young girl. So there is this, in this number 12, there is this, also the number, the wholeness of the number 12, like the 12 tribes of Israel. Of course, all these numbers always mean something, but this 12 years in this particular story um, speaks to a powerful number of years in the life of a woman. Mark notes the economic implications of this woman, woman's condition. She spent all that she had. So now she is truly, truly um, desperate, has no money, cannot be around people, and there's no hope for her for any cure, no hope for her to be one with the community again or to ever really be able to come back because she is unclean. And one of the things I, I always love to point out is just imagine the unclean, the unclean, being unclean in this time period is you have to, when you're within like 30 yards of anyone, you have to yell out and scream, I am unclean. I am unclean. Can you imagine walking out of your house and seeing your neighbor walk down the sidewalk and say, uh, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, and having to scream that everywhere you go. This is the life of this woman. And she was no better, she only grew worse. And she said, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. And that is literally, I will be saved. So it's not just even the stopping of the blood, it's the, it's the 
I will be saved from this wretched life in which I find myself. Both the woman and Jesus sense the flow of the healing power through physical contact. In verse 30, Jesus said, who touched me, she automatically knew that she was healed. She felt it in her body. Um, he looked around to see who had done it. Mark often links in the book of Mark is something for you when you see something about uh, sight in the book of Mark. He very often links physical sight to spiritual insight. He mm. looked around to see who had done it, yet he also looked around to see who had the knowledge that he had the power that just a touch would heal them. <laughs> so there's that double that double nature of he looked around to see who had done it. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus speaks these words, and in, in not these exact words, but he speaks these this sentiment to the lepers as well, right? To the one leper that comes back. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The others go to the temple for what? To get the blessing from the priests. You have to show yourself physically to the priests and show your, your skin clean, and then you are clear to go back into community. But Jesus says, you are healed. Go in peace and go back to being a member of society and community and give thanks to God. Some people came to the leader's house and said, from the house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Once again, um, noting that these are people that call Jesus teacher. They call him rabbi. So they give him credence and authority so they know his story. Peter, James, and John, of course, the inner circle for Jesus here. Um, weeping and wailing loudly here. Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. In this context, this is an ambiguous expression, since the verb sometimes does indicate death. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 1 Thessalonians 5, 10. However, here, it seems not to. When Jesus uses it, those are the epistles, but when Jesus uses it and says, but they are just sleeping, it has a, a holier purpose to it and say, they're not dead. They literally are just sort of sleeping right here. Little girl, get up. Talitha kum is literally in the Greek, little girl, rise up. It's used elsewhere for resurrection in 2 Kings 18.26, but also in Mark 15.34. Rise up get up and immediately she did there's a there again she's 12 years of age and what is she about to start doing since she is now a young woman she is about to start her menstrual cycle so there's this this notion of womanhood in these 12 years and and with this 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 physical cycle of, of a woman's of a, of a woman's um, livelihood a woman's life um, that is occurring here that's also double. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this. Jesus enjoined silence about his healing power again and told them to give her some food. Andrea, here's that point that you were talking about again. Food connotates restored life in God's coming kingdom. So not only in chapter 6, verse 37 and other places where Jesus is feeding crowds and feeding multitudes. It's not just giving them food. It symbolizes the restored life in God's coming kingdom. The balance of the basileia of God, the realm of God, the way things are going to be when God is, when God's realm is, comes about, is often mentioned in this, this connotation of give them something to eat. Jesus says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. In 631, you give them and you restore life in God's coming kingdom. And here, 
this young girl also represents that, um, this restored life in God's coming kingdom, celebrated by getting something to eat. And when we think about it now in terms of having something to eat and restored life in God's king, kingdom and kingdom, it matters differently now when Jesus says, I'm hungry, do you have any fish? Upon his resurrection. And when they, when they come on the seaside and have fish with Jesus, this whole physical eating is not just a bodily thing, but it also connotes this restored life in God's coming kingdom when Jesus in his own resurrection eats. So here you have two women specifically lifted up and lifted up in our scriptures today. Your thoughts and your conversations on this. I was thinking about those daughters of Jerusalem, <laughs> of <laughs> Israel again. You know, it's um, like when you read about the wailing, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. at Jairus' house. That was a typical activity that women of the community did. And also, you know, wealthy people could hire hire professional mourners. Mm -hmm. And they were usually women, you know, that, that screamed and cried. They they kind of represented the grief of all of, of Israel, you know? You know, Lisa, um, there's a woman that I've worked with, with Lab Shul, who has um, who is lifting up that tradition again? A young woman who is lifting up that tradition of the wailing and the, and the attendant to to the morning and the attendant to these kinds of situations. And um, I remember what I did is I sang one of the moans from from that I very often grew up with in uh, Pentecostal and Missionary Baptist churches where you where you just sort of moan the lyric and you moan the, you moan the tone um, of the song and it's and it's metered and it goes out and people, the church repeats it and there's there's just this this something guttural that comes up from that and I I pair it with that as well this this moaning and this wailing that you're talking about it's actually in the liturgy in in some African American worship. Um, services. I remember in Missionary Valley Baptist Church in Mississippi, Marks, Mississippi, it literally said in the bulletin, the moan. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I've heard it, you know, mm -hmm. and I've been at services where it's been done, you know, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like, it's interesting because I was raised Presbyterian. None of that was going on. Yeah. But it's, it's like a cultural ancestral thing yeah it's like you don't have to be taught that you know yeah you kind of like join in on that and it's like a communal way of grieving and 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 saying like i understand i'm right there with you i you know i get it without words it's like uh the notion that uh the spirit interprets our groans to the to the father you know, and then slavers would would hear the words "Amazing Grace" or "Father, I stretch my hands to Thee," and wouldn't wouldn't really gather the fact that it was a there was a deep guttural sense of relief, a moan, a pain, and wouldn't stop them from singing either. So, mm -hmm. and once again, when you say that, I just wanted to point out that. Um, these two healing stories are, uh, let me see, uh, what did I say before? Uh, show more. That these two stories in our New Testament text pay attention to female suffering. A little girl dying, um, and her father seeking Jesus out is unexpected in this text. Uh, unexpected in, in, our, in our lexicon of texts. Uh, a woman who is, who is bleeding, who's made poor by not being able to be healed by this thing that makes her unclean, that people would say, then it must be something, some sin that you have done that is being visited upon you. 
you know, that kind of not just physical, but social outcast kind of suffering. Um, the idea that she had money to actually pay to try and get cures from that also means that a person of standing has been lowered and dejected to a person of nothing. So this attention to the suffering of women is very powerful in this text. Your other thoughts and ideas around here? I, you know, oh yeah, this, this is what I'm thinking of. Um, the fact that Jesus didn't raise up the little girl in front of a whole battery of people. Yeah. You know, um, he put everybody out and then he told the, 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 the few that were in the, in the room with him not to say anything. You know, keep it low key. There's that mark and secret again. Yeah. And it's like he's not ready for the furor that will occur by actually raising a dead person in front of everybody, you know? Yeah. I, I think that came with Lazarus, you know? And then everything jumped off after Lazarus, you know, it, it was uh... yeah, the book of Mark is really, really specific about keeping that language, keeping that secret of Christ's, um, keeping it quiet, you know, um, as a literary tool, we get to know it of what he's doing. And then all of a sudden, it's like, he's doing this, he's healing this, he's raising this person, he's doing this, he's, he, he's casting out demons, and he's telling everybody not to not to say anything. And then by the time we get to the end of it, he gets up in the book of Mark, and tells, tells her to go and tell everybody, and she's afraid and tells no one. In the in the original ending of the book of Mark, the thought is to go back now and know that with him getting up, you are assured of his of his heavenly and divine stature um, from everything that you've witnessed from this miracle at the end of this book, the end of this book of Mark. And then you go back to the beginning and you read it voraciously over again and you read it with new eyes. So the miracles are even grander and your faith is made even stronger. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful literary tool and thinking that many of the things, the gospels, if you're of the gospel, if you're of the Mithian school, you're going to read Matthew over and over. If you're the Markan school, you're going to read Mark over and over. Same thing with John, same thing with, um, with Luke. So it's a really great way to keep that reader and to keep that, those people who were the no nonsense Markans really just sort of staying in touch with their um, hands-on understanding of Christ. Who touched my clothes? Uh, the woman with the issue of blood, she really took a chance. Oh, yeah. You know, she, she was like at a level of desperation because like you were talking about what was permitted and what was not permitted. Um, number one, you know, the fact that she was unclean. She wasn't supposed to touch anyone. And then women weren't supposed to touch men that were not their husbands, you know, and then she touched the hem or the, um, the, the, the tassels of his garment, you know, which could be symbolic in a way, but, um, that would have been like the most holy thing on a man, you know, and her and her condition, definitely would have <laughs> um, 
any other man would say, oh, I got to take this off and burn it, you know, that kind of thing. Good. And I'll add to that, too, that she was supposed to be saying, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Mm -hmm. So I, you would think that people were scattering from around her, but she obviously didn't say that if she got that close with and a crowd around. She slipped in with all those people that were trying to take get something from Jesus. Right, right. And the other thing, the other thing that's implied here that that I think is really interesting that, you know, I won't, I won't say as a fact, but I will say as an implication for me, is that with all of these people honing in on Jesus and touching up on him and feeling him and squeezing him around like this, none had the faith enough to be healed by a touch. Yeah. All, I, cause she's not the yeah. only person touching Jesus. Yes. Right. You know, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? Because only one right. withdrew power from me. Because only one oh. knew and believed. Wow. Woo. That's a sermon. <laughs> that and always, that, always have, gave me the, the chills to think about that. And I have another question. Well, I don't think any one of us could answer it. But did Jairus get in trouble? <laughs> Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that could be another reason why I told him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. The leader of the synagogue. And that there was another sort of a subliminal message too that Jesus was on his pl on his way to one place and something happened on the way. Uh huh. And and I just kept thinking, you know, that happens to us sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on our way to do something that we've decided we have to do, whatever it is. And on the way, we see uh, somebody who's fallen on the sidewalk or something, and you stop because it's a part of the journey, kind of thing. Um. Yeah, that, you know, that, that happens a lot. I mean, with me taking care of my mother, for example, we can be on our way to lunch and she hasn't had lunch and, you know, I mean, she's hungry and all that. And something happens. Somebody comes to the car and, you know, they want to talk or whatever. And you stop what you're doing mm -hmm. to, to sort of tend to them and, and support them before you move on and then when you get to lunch it turns out that actually lunch is better than you thought it was going to be <laughs> yeah. because you get a chance to do that too you know um, that happened on sunday when my plane was three hours late going to syracuse yeah it was completely worth it because mm -hmm. there was a, a group of a two people behind me who didn't know one another and their conversation was in earshot of me i was seated by myself and it was a completely necessary, needed healing conversation between these two strangers, one who had lost her husband just recently and, you know, and her mother and another had lost his brother, her talking about trying to get reinstituted back in life and her grief. But the way that they had that conversation for the entire flight, the entire elongated taxi on the <laughs> runway, it was supposed to be five minutes that lasted for 45 minutes was so healing mm. so healing for both of them and i as i was waiting to get up the plane i just turned to them i was wearing my collar i said you know so whatever you were speaking about in detail i said i just want to let you know that the the energy of healing and the spiritual blessing that you have been to one another will go with you from this place it has wow. truly been a holy thing. And that was worth all the being late, all Absolutely. the hanging around LaGuardia, Absolutely. all the running from, from gate right. to gate to gate to gate to gate to gate. It was worth it. That's right. On yeah, the but, way. Yeah. That conversation was for you, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, oh, I, I, I took note of that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. And to us. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, you never know why you're put in a specific place <laughs> at a specific time, even though it may be aggravating as I don't know what. You know, the, your uh, story reminds me 
when New Year's Eve, and this was when I was like maybe 21, 22, something like that, uh, my, my phone rang. This was way before cell phones, so it was my landline. <laughs> and um, it was a, um, a wrong number call. It was a young man. And he and I had a conversation like for wow. an hour and a half. And we got off the phone and I realized I didn't even get his number. <laughs> you know? And this was before, you know, like, you know, Star 69 and all mm -hmm, of those kinds mm -hmm. of gimmicks and whatnot. And I, I never forgot that. And I said, you know what, if I didn't get his number and he didn't get mine, we weren't supposed to get our numbers. We were just supposed to have that nice conversation. That's it. That's it. See, Anthony, thank you. One of my favorite songs, my mom's favorite songs is this Victorian song. It's on the way to Cape May. <laughs> And it's a, it's a it's this silly little ditty, but all these things happen on the way to Cape May. Somebody falls in love and gets married. Somebody does this, and it's all on the way to Cape May. So that reminds me of that, Andrea, when you said that on the way. That's right. <laughs> I am encouraged by this um, by these words and this. I think I'll be preaching on this on Sunday, don't you think, y'all? Mm -hmm. Just something about these two young ladies, these two women, and all that's in between. So just remember, it's restored physical, social well-being is restored mm -hmm. through contact. And I'm going to add something else in here. Edit this social, physical, social, spiritual. Yeah. And it lets us know that sometimes when we think that forbidden contact, through forbidden contact on the way, we can save lives, right? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Or at least you can be present. There you go. Because you there never you know go. whether it's saving a life or saving a moment or saving a trip or whatever. You know, God will do the rest, you know. But if we are present, like you said to those people, you know, you took the time to, to give them your insight from what you heard, yeah. which was probably more of a blessing than you knew. No, that's what they said. They said, they said, I cannot tell you what that means coming from you. And I'm going to hold that. I'm like, that's why you wear, that's why you wear the collar. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you listen. Yeah. So all of this after Jesus calmed the sea and did all that other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Mark just keeps Jesus going like this. <laughs> was busy. Yeah. And I would love to. I would love to, you know, and the thing is, we know that there were, there were five people in the room with Jesus when Jairus' daughter got up, when she rose. And the people who were wailing outside, I, want, I always wonder, like, what happened when she came out through the room and got something to eat? They probably said, you know, that she wasn't really dead. She might have been, you know. She was sleeping. He was right. What a rabbi. What a teacher. <laughs> but even that, even that is a miracle. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the, what I love about the book of Mark, and I, this is something I always forget to explain because it's one of my passions about this book, is that Mark does these things that even when Jesus doesn't, it says, don't tell, how people would react anyway would spread the news. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter if they knew that she was dead and, and she got up and Jesus said Talitha Kum. What matters is that Jairus went to go get her, went to go get Jesus. Jesus came in. He went into the room with five people. The next thing she comes up and she's ready to eat. That would spread like wildfire. So I love the book of Mark. And when, you, when we're reading the book of Mark as we move forward, 
Think about how the people would relay the story because that's the beautiful thing about the Mark and Secret in the book of Mark. It's like, even though Jesus says, don't tell, look at all the crowds that still keep following him. And, and we know now that the book Mark is, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. is the oldest yes. of, the, of, the, of the Gospels. It's the first one written. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So, well, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask that you pray for Reverend Althelia Pond. Ooh. Within the, the second time within a month, she's contracted COVID. Oh, no. Oh, boy, yeah. no. Yeah, she just called me this afternoon to let me know and asked us to pray for her. And um, oh. if she moves through this, and hopefully that it won't have these those lingering effects that so many people have, so... Mm -hmm. And um, continue to keep my family in prayer as we send home my Aunt Mag, my Aunt Margaret. So I finished that obituary today. And, and let us, I am encouraging all of us to think about what would happen if we stopped while we were on the way. Even if we stopped on the way and just prayed. Mm -hmm. um, I saw so many people agitated as they were waiting for the flight and as it was getting delayed over and over and over again. And something told me, just pray. Mm. And I prayed for so many people. Um, and there was peace on that plane. And then even if it's just in my own mind, it just felt like it was right. Mm -hmm. So on the way, mm -hmm. Most gracious God, on the way, may we pray for continued healing for folks. Oh, yes. Pray for continued healing for Sister Sister Mary. Thank you. That she is with us and she is giving us her input and we know that she is claiming your strength and we are claiming that on the way to whatever it is we're doing now, we are lifting her up. Thank you. Thank you. We lift up Reverend Althelia Pond with this dreadful thing of COVID again and ask that you would let her get the rest that she needs to heal mm -hmm. and let her continue to get the medicine that she needs to as the pharmaceutical companies start jacking up the prices yeah to $1,600 a dose mm -hmm. and gracious God we ask that every person who's under the sound of our voices that we will know that you took the time on your way to heal the world, bless the world, to make things happen in the world. You take the time on the way to all that to think about us, to touch our lives, to love us. May we follow that example because we know that if you didn't stop on the way to us, on the way to what you were doing and stop for us, we know where we would be. And we're yeah. so grateful. <laughs> we are so grateful, oh God. So we ask that you would help us to mirror you in your grace, in your love. And go from this place in peace, knowing that if we reach out to touch you, that you will know and say, who touched me? You have been made well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah.